scares the shit out of me. Because I think that every human being has value. And I don't think that you can basically calculate the net worth of a human being, right? But this is a worrying perspective. Why? From an economic and ideological perspective. Remember, go back to the first industrial revolution and Marxism. There was a working man or a woman who was needed in order for the economy to grow. That issue had to be addressed. Labor rights, working hours, health care, salaries, holidays. Right? That's what the socialist movement was based on, and in some cases communist movements as well. But the bottom line was that that human being knew that he or she was needed. What if we start approaching a society which doesn't have one? What happens to that human being? What happens to his or her worth? This is something that we seriously need to start looking at. And it's not science fiction. So the fourth industrial revolution, it's more difficult, I think, to address uh, this, this question. So my sort of answer to all of this is, is, is that there's not going to be a simple solution. And when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the future of work, I often get asked the question from younger people that, you know, what should I study? And I can only basically give everyone three pieces of humble advice, and I've probably picked them from different types of places, but, but this is what, what I would say. The first thing is that when you are at school or in university, learn how to learn. Learn how to analyze. It's not anymore about acquiring information and organizing that information in your head uh, for eternity. No, you have to learn to get different types of analytical impulses. And I think for the future of studying, this means that you're not only going to do you know, mathematics or philosophy or sociology or history or political science. You'll probably do something much, much broader. Second thing, learn skills of empathy. And by that I mean the way in which you treat other human beings. Because at the end of the day, and I will say that at the end of my presentation today, the more and more we start approaching a world which is machine-like, which is technologically driven, the more and more you will need to be able to focus on human relations and human contact. Unless, of course, you want to live a machine-like uh, life, which I don't think that many of us actually do. Uh, and the third thing that you need to do is, in, in study, you need to learn how to start taking care of yourself. And by that I mean not self-management, because that sounds somehow crude, but think constantly about things which make you happy, which fulfill your life, you know, whether it's exercise, whether it's reading, whether it's managing your time, whether it's coping with stress. So almost like you learn how to take care of yourself in, in, in this sort of busy world. So these are the three things I would do. Learn how to analyze, learn empathy, and learn how to take care of yourself. That's what I want to say on economics. Uh, there are many more issues, many more issues here. Second one is on politics. Um, and this is probably a field that I know a little bit, little bit better because I am a political scientist. And my big thinking in all of this, and I'm looking at this from a Western perspective, my big thinking in all of this is, is the following. Uh, I think there are three ideologies that have basically dominated the past 100 years in the Western world. Uh, fascism, communism, and liberalism, right? And one could say that 1945, end of World War II, that was the death of fascism. Yeah? 1989, the end of the Cold War and the bipolar world, that was the end of communism. And 2016, I hope, is not the end of liberalism because of Brexit and Donald Trump. But there is a possibility that people are starting to question the three basic ingredients of a successful society, which quite often have been liberal democracy, uh, social market economy, and globalization. 
And I think this is a battle worth uh, taking. Do you remember 1989? Some of you will. It was the end of history era, right? The era of hope. The Berlin Wall comes down. Nelson Mandela is freed. Václav Havel roams the streets of Prague. East meets West. And everyone says, like Fukuyama, that we will all convert into liberal democracies and social market economies. I mean, nation states would be stupid not to do that. Of course, things have gone a little bit different. We're not anymore in that sort of era of, of, of optimism. And actually, we are in many ways, I would argue, in, in an era even of, 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 of hate, or at least bigotry, if, if we look at the political discourse that we're, we're using today. A second observation on that, what, what, you know, what, what does artificial intelligence and technology have to do with it? Well, I think actually quite a lot. Do you remember the Arab Spring, sort of 2010, 2011? We all thought that, look, Social media, Twitter, Facebook, technology, that'll open up all societies. Look, revolutions take place. People come to squares to have big debates, uh, to, to move, remove dictatorships. Liberalism, democracy will win. But did that happen? Or did we move from a digital democracy more towards a digital dictatorship? I'm not sure. But I certainly hope that we did. So what I'm trying to say is that technology can be used for and against the liberal idea. Two old books which are always good to go back to. Uh, George Orwell, 1984. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. And the interpretation of both of them, Neil Postman, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Now, are we in a George Orwell, 1984 world where... Basically, everything that we do are controlled by cameras. That information is skewed and packed. That you have no freedom. Or are we in an Aldox Huxley Brave New World where basically we have so much information that we can't process it anymore. That we are sort of enslaved to the information flow that's going on. I don't know. I sometimes feel overburdened by information, that there's simply too much of it. And once you get into that stage, you almost become indifferent to that information. I mean, how many of you want to listen to or read Donald Trump's tweets anymore? <laughs> there's one. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's a sign of times, you know. But to a certain extent, it's a scary sign of times as well. And then we get to the question of, you know, who is controlling the facts? The funny thing with us humans is that we are actually, quite often, we like stories more than facts. Mm -hmm. I'd kind of like to have factual stories, but, you know, the truth is that we don't always uh, get those. So we are in a sort of information flow type of a, of a, of a world where we also have very close uh, control. Big data is one thing that's linked to politics which to a certain extent worries me, but at the same time is, is exciting. But you see, I mean, you think about your lives today, right? Uh, everything that you do is somehow recorded by big data somewhere around, right? <coughs> your mobile phone will know that you are now at a lecture or discussion on artificial intelligence. It'll know how you got here. It'll know where you live. It'll know what you uh, bought for groceries. It'll probably know what you ate. If you have one of these watches, it'll probably know how much you've moved today, what you exercised, what you did. It'll know your bank account. It'll know your insurance. It'll know your mortgage. It'll know the books that you have bought, read, or borrowed from a library. It'll know the stuff that you have written by email, right? You start getting the picture? Suddenly we're in a world where, you know, data is more valuable than money or is more valuable than gold or is more valuable than, than oil. And then you get to the question, who controls that data? Now, in old liberal democratic politics, it was kind of easy. You know, John Locke's second civil treaty is a government. Why do you need a constitution? For two things. One is to protect the minority from the majority. And the other one is to protect the individual from the state. Well, who protects us? from the mining and roaming of data today? I don't know. 
I really don't know. Should this be regulated? My answer is yes. Who should be regulating it? The good guys rather than the bad guys, right? Who are the good guys? It's value judgment. It's very difficult to say. 